welcome to the Live and Invest Overseas podcast. Please visit us at liveandinvestoverseas.com slash podcast for more information on living better and retiring well overseas. Hello, I'm Kathleen Petticord. And I'm Leif Simon. And we're back with another Live and Invest Overseas podcast. Thank you for joining us. This is an exciting week for us. This week, our new How to Buy Real Estate Overseas for Cash Flow and the Better Life book, co-authored by Leif Simon and me, uh, is in bookstores across the United States, available also online on Amazon. We, of course, would love for you to go buy a copy. Thank you. But uh, meantime, we'd also like to start sharing some of the information in this book, which we hope will be helpful as you are thinking, we hope, about taking advantage of what we believe is the biggest overseas real estate investment buying opportunity of our lifetimes right now. Right. So the book uh, was conceived a year ago, finished earlier this year, but the timing for it being in bookstores being published, I think, couldn't be better. So let's dive in. In fact, we're going to go straight to the back of the book. <laughs> we're going to start in the appendix area. Appendix C is a due diligence checklist. And so in our e-letters, we're talking all the time about why buy real estate overseas, where to look to buy real estate overseas, what specifically to buy. We talk about specific current uh, purchase and investment opportunities. But there's a lot of, of um, backstory. There's a lot right. of information you need under your belt in your head before you set out to actually make a purchase in, and that's what this checklist is about right. and we get into that information in both the global property advisor um, subscription service right and the real estate webinars that we do as well as the annual real estate conference but this is uh, a good place to start at the back of the book here okay so i'm going to run through these points and also one more uh comment this checklist in this book is focused primarily on due diligence points for someone if you are looking to make a purchase overseas for investment, primarily for profit reasons. The other reason to buy a piece of real estate overseas is for fun because it's a place you want to spend time, full or part time, uh, as a second home or maybe as a place to live in retirement. Yeah. And there you're going to consider some different aspects, ask some different questions. We're going to look at those next week. In next week's uh, podcast, this week, we're focusing specifically on shopping for an investment property. Well, and, or additional questions, because the first question here is right. plays, plays out for any for property you're going to buy. What is your budget? And it's a more complicated question than you may think. Oh, well, I have $100,000. I'll go buy a $100,000 property. Um, that's typically what you do in the States or in the States, you get qualified for a certain amount based off of uh, your ability to repay a mortgage overseas. Um, you're likely going to pay cash. And the real kicker that most people don't recognize and uh, understand until they get into it is the closing costs are going to be much higher in the U S even without a mortgage in the U S you'll have, you know, maybe mortgage points and other closing costs, um, related to that, that add to what you have to pay, but usually that'll end up rolled into the mortgage. So you don't have to think about it overseas. If you've got a hundred thousand dollar budget, you may only be able to buy a $90,000 property, depending on what the closing costs are in the country that you're buying. And the biggest hit that you're going to take is what's called the transfer tax. And so there's uh, a range around the world between 1% and 9%, 10% sometimes. Um, and these figures change even within countries. During our time in Ireland, Ireland was moving the transfer tax, trying to control the the, the market real, was so frothy. Yeah, the real estate bubble there. Uh, it's settled out now, and it hasn't changed in a while. But it, at one point, um, when we first moved there, the transfer tax was uh, a few uh, percent. Uh, maybe I think we paid five percent. Um, it went up to nine percent, mm -hmm. um, and now it's back down to I think two percent. Um, and right as you're saying, the, the total cost of, of uh, transferring a property, buying or selling, varies dramatically country to country. The most expensive right now, I think, is probably Belize. Yeah, Belize has uh, an extra transfer tax for foreigners, um, trying to help, again, keep the prices from getting too expensive from too many foreigners coming in. Um, but it, it's it, uh, that's 8% in Belize right now, the transfer tax. I still think there are some countries out there with 9%, but I can't okay. think of off the top of my head. Okay, yeah. great. All right, question or point number two on our due diligence checklist, what comes with the property? Right, 
if you're again in the States, maybe the appliances come with the property, maybe they don't. When you're buying a new place, um, brand new construction, uh, typically the developer is gonna have a package that includes uh, those appliances and everything else you expect to be in there, lighting fixtures, the kitchen cabinets, the bathroom cabinets. Um, in other countries that may not be the case, even if you're buying uh, a resale property, in Argentina in particular, but other countries, um, the lighting fixtures don't come with a resale property. That's something you can negotiate, but don't expect them to be there when you uh, go into the into the property after you close, if you haven't negotiated uh, that. Uh, in France, for example, for rentals, a lot of them uh, don't come with any uh, furniture, any cabinets in the kitchen. Right, which can be shocking. Right. So you're you're you can end up with a with blank walls in the kitchen, and you as a mm -hmm. renter need to install countertops, cabinets, and all right. the appliances. Right. You, you get a, we've seen pictures. You get a kitchen sink, so it's just it's a a very bare looking kitchen. Um, same thing with uh, lighting fixtures, even in in some rentals uh, in Paris and other places. So you want to ask what's included. Definitely ask what's included if you're buying new, buying pre construction. And uh, don't assume, for example, that because the developer is putting in the connections for uh, a split air conditioner, right. that they're um, including the split air conditioner with the uh, in each room with the, because very with often the purchase price. If it's, not, be the case. if it's not specifically stated, it, it won't be. Uh, it won't be there. Okay. Then a very important question that might not occur to you again, coming from the U.S. from U.S. markets, you take a lot of things for granted. But in other markets, you need to ask the questions in for this case. And for example, what are the zoning rules? Right. If you this is one reason to buy in a uh, gated community overseas, especially in Latin America, uh, assuming that there is an HOA and the HOA uh, rules are defined. But uh, the big example given for this is in Ecuador by our friend Lee Harrison, mm -hmm. um, where there is no zoning, really. And so you could buy a place today and two weeks after you move in, somebody open a nightclub two doors down in a, in a house um, or a butcher um, shop. A butcher shop. Yeah. I'm right. trying to, th trying to <laughs> think of the uh, abattoir for, right. for uh, in one place this happened where the Lee knows um, they just started butchering pigs and selling pigs out of their garage. So you uh, need to look around, buy in a neighborhood where you think that's not going to happen, but, ask if there are any specific zoning rules. Some places do have uh, zoning rules. Medellin is an interesting one where uh, there has to be so much uh, park space per capita in a neighborhood. So if a, if a developer is coming in to put in a, a new high rise, as they've done in our neighborhood in Medellin mm -hmm. over the years, mm -hmm. um, they have to uh, provide more park space. And so there's one park that's been growing. The houses around it have been uh, sold uh, by these developers. Um, and torn down and added to the park space. So, so sometimes sometimes there are rules that are beneficial and it's good to know those. We didn't know that one before we exactly. bought there, but this park across our apartment, the street from our apartment has uh, gotten bigger and nicer over the years. And so Medellin is such a green city and this is why. And they, they work very hard to keep it green even as it grows in density. Okay, what is your access? Right, this is um, really more pertinent to you're buying land property in a rural area how are you going to get to it um, in uh, Ireland for example the house that we bought there had easy, perfect access to the uh, um, to the house um, as it turns out we own the barn that the farmer next door we still own it um, we have the title to it uh, the farmer next door uh, thinks he owns or says he owns and he actually does it just never got segregated properly um, but at the moment, we have zero access to that barn because we don't own the house anymore and the farmer owns the property next door. So you want to know how you're going to access the property. The direction that the real estate agent takes you isn't necessarily um, the actual access to the property. And so they may take you the most convenient way through somebody else's property. Or the most picturesque way, the, the most, most scenic most, way. Right. Whereas the actual access, I can think about this actually happened to me looking at a piece of property on Roatan in uh, Honduras, where the real estate agent took me down a lovely coastal road, but the access to the property was by the landfill. Right. So. Right. I remember that. <laughs> or, yeah, especially if you're looking on an, on an island, um, Roatan or Ambergris Key, the real estate agents may take you in a boat 
and you act, you visit from the front. Um, but what is the access like on land and how are you going to get there? And if you're building or right. doing anything, how, how are your supplies going to get there? Okay. Is there an HOA, a homeowners association? Right. And um, most people don't like an HOA because of the HOA fees. But if there is an HOA, and there's going to be, um, or should be if you're buying in a building, um, but if you're buying in a gated community as well, there should be a registered HOA. And the HOA is meant to take care of things, meant to maintain uh, maintain the building. So is there an HOA? But also then, how is the HOA managed? Who's the bo- who's been on the board? Are what they, are the current finances? Right. How, are are people up to date on their payments? Is there uh, is there money in the bank? Have they created a sinking fund for future expenses? Um, one example in Panama that we use is a building, and we saw um, a, a property listed. Um, and the owner was very, uh, had a good sense of humor yeah, about his I, he, challenge. Yeah. Very char- charismatic <laughs> ad, um, basically saying you don't need to join a gym because this apartment's on the 14th floor and currently the elevators in the building don't work. Um, it was an older building, but the reason the elevators didn't work was because nobody in the building wanted to pay, um, the capital call to fix the elevator. Elevators are expensive. Right. And so that um, that was a, that's a problem for the guy selling, of course, it's a problem for you living there. So you want to understand how the HOA um, functions and, and what the finances are. And if, are. You, if it were a rental investment for you, it'd it be a disaster. It'd be a disaster. Yeah. Okay. How much is, is the HOA fee? Right. That's a, a another great question to kind of look at from two sides. Of course, you don't want to pay more out of pocket than you have to, but you want to pay as much as you need to to maintain the property. And in, in many countries, the property taxes are very low. So if you're in a gated community, um, and like say Belize, for example, and your property taxes are $10 a year, but your HOA fee is, is $1,000 a year, um, and that covers everything for the roads and maintenance that you need for that, uh, that project, um, you should be th- thrilled. So you have to look at the total cost and what you're getting for that. And again, you want things to be maintained. So that building with the elevator, um, mm-hmm. they weren't charging enough to uh, create a sinking fund for that kind of large repair. Um, so you, you, again, want to be making sure that there's the HOA fee is high enough, uh, not necessarily low enough. Right, okay. Are you allowed to rent short term? Really, really important question. Right. If there, you're buying a rental. There's, there are restrictions. Um, country by country, city by city, and building by building. So the one building that we have our apartment in in uh, Paris, when we moved to Panama, we had uh, decided to put it up for short-term rental so we could use it ourselves still, thinking we'd go back to Paris regularly at that time. And after about the first year, we got a letter from the Syndic, the HOA there is called the Syndic, um, Time is basically to cease and desist on renting anything less than a one-year lease, and that was a rule in the uh, HOA documents. So, um, so we switched to one-year uh, rentals. It was easier anyway, as it turned out. We weren't going back to Paris as often as we wanted to at the time. In other places, the hotel industries have uh, mm-hmm. forced in rules. So, Panama City is one example. You can't rent legally for less than 45 days um, in Panama City. In uh, Colombia, it's 30 days, unless your HOA building specifically allows for it. Not that they have a rule against it, it's that they have to have mandate for it. And in Medellin in particular, most buildings don't, and you're not likely to get uh, people to uh, vote to change that. So you have, but 30 days is um, not an uncommon time for people to spend uh, in in Medellin, so it, it can work out. It can be, uh, yeah, exactly. But it you, can you, be you just need to understand the rules. All right. How far away are day-to-day services? This again comes into play, I think, if you're buying a rental and right. you know you're you want your renters to uh, look at the listing and think, oh, well, this is convenient. This is going to be a comfortable place to stay. Right. So where where are the grocery stores? Where are the restaurants? Where are the uh, the metro stations, the access to public transportation? Right, that's a really um, good and, point. And, and it depends on the city again, of course. So if you're, and if you're not in the city, then it becomes even more important how close is the nearest town for uh, for you know, the groceries and things. So um, in Paris, I used to say the one rental that we had, 
I liked it a lot because there was a grocery store two doors down and, and a parking structure four doors down. And Kathy made fun of me. Um, but we had renters who were, you know, they they were either driving in from somewhere else um, from France or they were coming to Paris and then renting a car for day trips mm -hmm. and having that parking structure um, nearby was very helpful. I did tease you, but you were right. <laughs> All right. What are the total carrying costs? So this goes back to your budget, We right. our first point. And for the budget, you're looking at your total transfer costs, buying and selling, but then there's also the carrying costs, which need to be factored into the overall math of the investment. Right. So if you're doing a long-term or short-term rental, you'll, you'll have your, you know, your standard cost. If you have a mortgage, those payments, um, then if it's a short-term rental, you'll have the utility costs. So how much is it going to be to have, you know, internet, uh, and cable each month? What are the, what are the estimated, uh, utility fees? What are the property taxes going to be? Um, but you also then want to factor in the, then the HOA fee, um, mm -hmm. of course, but then fa factor in something for maintenance and repairs um, and replacement in the uh, in the apartment. Uh, you're going to uh, furnish the place for short term. You're going to have dishes and things for short term, mm -hmm. but dishes break, spoons go missing, and it's really Lens hard. Lens need to be replaced. Lens need to be replaced. It's really hard to put things that you know a spoon that goes missing or, or broken glass on the individual uh, renter each time that there's turnover. And so you're gonna have those replacement costs that you need to include in your budget as well. We have created uh, for the purposes of the book, a, a spreadsheet that is gonna be posted online on our Live and Invest Overseas website to help you do all of this math, this projecting of your purchase cost, uh, if you're financing, and then your carrying costs and your transfer costs, the total costs of, of being in the property and managing it as a rental. And well, I'll just give you the URL for that. Well, I, I'll, I'll, I can read the URL, but the, it really it's to help you calculate your uh, projected yield. So it's, a, it's very basic from an input perspective on expenses um, and the purchase uh, costs. There's, there's just a few numbers to put in. So you have to include all of your um, transfer taxes and things mm -hmm. in your purchase price. It's not a separate line item there, but then it help help you calculate and project uh, a, a, a net yield that you can then compare other properties to. And so it's a long URL, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So it's www.liveandinvestoverseas.com slash how to do overseas cash flow math. So again, that's how to do overseas cash flow math. And uh, it's a useful tool to get some you know quick projections on what your yield might be for long-term or short-term um, and includes, and this is one of the other things to include in your uh, carrying costs, uh, a line for uh, management fees. So you want to understand what the management fees are going to be, the rental and property management fees, especially for a short-term rental, because they can range from 15% to 35%, sometimes more, depending on the market and the, the manager. Okay. All right. One final due diligence question. Does the development company, the developer, have a track record? Right. If you're buying something um, from a developer, pre-construction, um, what have they done before? They're in Central America in particular, there are a lot of what I call gringo cowboy developers who come down, buy a piece of land, think they're going to carve it up, flip the lots quickly and make a killing. Um, and some of those projects turn out fine. There's one near us in Panama that, mm -hmm. the, you know, the people got what they paid for. It's not a great development, but they got their title. They have a road, they have electricity. Um, and, and those sound like basic things, but it doesn't but always work out that way. It doesn't always work out that way. <laughs> uh, and then there's big developments that, that just go belly up and think, you know, it seems like there's money behind them. Um, there's a big one in Belize that uh, that had issues in Placencia or near Placencia, Dangriga, actually. Um, and so what's the developer's track record? In Panama, uh, for example, we work with a, a developer in the city who's been around for 35 years, I think pushing 40 years. Mm -hmm. Um, we bought from them. We own in one of their buildings right now. Hundreds of our readers have, have bought uh, from them and, over, the de over the decade. Right. Sometimes, and a half we've worked with sometimes them. you might question a particular quality of something in one of the apartments, but they complete the apartments, you get the apartments, and they're solid apartments overall. So um, ask those questions about who is the developer, what's their experience, and really how are they funding the, the development? Right. Um, because even um, big developers, each, each new building is a separate. Uh, project except a company and may have separate uh, funding. Right. And the riskiest form of funding obviously would be through sales. 
So if the developer is planning to, to fund uh, in, you know, the construction costs through sales, that doesn't necessarily mean you back out. Uh, it doesn't have to be a deal breaker, but it's definitely the riskiest right. way to go. All right, we are going to call it a, uh, a day, a morning for this week's podcast. Again, our new book, Buying Real Estate Overseas for Cash Flow and a Better Life, is available in bookstores and on Amazon. Go have a look for it. We hope you will buy it, read it, enjoy it, and find value in it. We will be back next week with part two of this conversation, looking at due diligence questions related specifically to when you're buying for personal use, for retirement or as a second home. Thank you for listening to this Live and Invest Overseas podcast. We'll be in touch again soon. Bye, everyone. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed this episode of our Live and Invest Overseas podcast. For more, please visit liveandinvestoverseas.com slash podcast, where you'll find lots more information and resources to help you live better and retire well overseas.